Um, and again, these are things that kind of go into this. And as you know, I mean, I fell into, to be completely honest with you, I fell into um, researching diversity kind of by accident. You know, I started at, as Katie pointed out, I was at the University of Arizona when they started a program called Knowledge River that's aimed at bringing in Native American and Hispanic Latinos into the profession. And Arizona is a perfect place to try to do this. Because you have two, you have the Navajo and the Hopi reservation within the state. And you have an enormous Hispanic Latino population. Um, and you know, I had to do a pilot study. And so I did one on the motivations of the students that were part of Knowledge River to kind of bring in. Bring in. And I got one of the best pieces of feedback from the, from the professor I did the paper for. She thought it was fantastic, but her biggest piece of feedback was not to frame the, the participants as people who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Can you think about what was wrong about my perception? Because realistically, most of these people had kind of started from nothing and made it to that point. It wasn't an unrealistic thing to say that, but what was wrong with my perception of that? Um, well, it sort of presupposes that, I don't know, just what you were saying, that there weren't any outside factors that maybe helped them or to get to where they were, even even within the context that they were already in, which I'm not saying there was still, there's always factors, other factors. Right. I was going to say it was it was one of the worst things that it was doing was um, completely limiting them to a stereotype. You know, it was it was actually again as you kind of pointed out, it was stripping away the other factors, the other things that could have contributed to it. The other problem with it too is kind of a paternalistic view, isn't it? Like, oh, look at how good they did. You know, and I have to say I I'm always been incredibly grateful that I've had some really good people in my life very nicely kind of say, well, you know, you might want to think about it this way. And have, you know, kind of go, oh, yeah, that is a better way of thinking about it. Or, you know, having different points of view rather than have, having some of these people who I just now want to tell me are being stupid, um, you know, kind of put this a different way. But it's just, you know, it's again, what I was looking at was framed from my own experience. You know, I mean, I had somebody who paid for my college education, which I know not everybody gets, but God, that was nice. I paid for my <laughs> master's and my doctorate, and I'll be paying for it until I die. <laughs> but I, you know, I came from a family where that was, that was possible. I had a choice of colleges to go to. You know, so I was kind of framing their experiences through mine instead of just letting them tell me their experiences. You know, and again, these are things that kind of go into it. And, what I'm trying to get at here, and I feel like I'm, I'm babbling, which I do often, but <laughs> beside the point, is what I'm talking about here, my experiences, the way that I'm doing this, and I'd like to think that I've gotten more enlightened as time has gone on, but it's something I'm going to always have to kind of go back and question how I'm doing things. Because everything that I do is through the lens of my life, and you know, the experiences that I've had. And it's very hard to understand what other people have gone through if I can only base it on my own. Well, in LIS, what does that mean in how we approach who we try to recruit, how we try to bring people into the profession? 85% of us are white. Yeah. It means that a lot of what we're doing is filtering through that lens. And we don't recognize when there's barriers. We don't recognize things that have been set up institutionally. You know, one of the ones I think about is that LIS is a graduate degree. talk about education, it's to get people to be an LIS professional, you have to get through an undergraduate degree first. Depending on your program, you may have to take the SATs. Has anybody ever read about the issue? Not the SATs, the GRE. Well, yeah, you have to take the SATs too, but the GREs. Has anybody read about the issues connected to ETS testing? They have a tendency to be aimed at not just white, white males. Those are the people who gen generally attend. And again, sorry, males in the room, so not attacking you. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> Just pointing out <laughs> the things that are kind of, you know, a part of all of that. But I mean, again, it's kind of how we view things and how we 
approach things. And I got a really nice illustration of this when I was working on my doctorate. I was in a master's class. And we were talking about, um, it was a planning and evaluation course. And we were talking about, you know, outreach and things like that. And just kind of talking about, you know, making sure that people knew what the services were. And I made a comment. I said, you know, some people might, might not even know there's a library in their neighborhood. And I said that because one of the people from my pilot study literally did not know the building she walked by every day on her way to school was the public library until she took a school trip. And her teacher introduced her to the public library. Her family never did. She didn't know what the use of the building was. She didn't know that she could go in at any time. When she discovered it, she got her mother to take her there almost every day. But it was something that came through the school system. Well, my fellow student turned to me and said, oh, that's not the case at all. People know that they're there. And I just remember biting my tongue because it just didn't seem the place to have the meltdown, scream, whatever I wanted to do with her. And I knew that if I started debating, that's what the class was going to turn into. So I just kind of let it go. But it's, again, this idea that, well, everybody knows what the public library is. Everybody knows this. Well, of course, I, you know, I mean, I knew what they were. My grandmother was a librarian. My aunt was a librarian. I could not know what a library was. You know, and this is something that everybody knows, and they know it's there, and they know what it has to offer. You know, and this feeds into, again, that's because when you come from an educated family, you did know what the libraries were, you knew where they were, you knew how they could help you, chances are you spent a lot of time in them. Or if you didn't, it was because you didn't want to spend a lot of time with them, and you, you know, kind of worked in someplace else, but you knew it was there. <laughs> you know, and Again, we don't necessarily set things up to make it obvious if you don't have that point of view. You know, if you don't have these kinds of things that are feeding it. And we, it's, you know, I mean, I, I sound like I'm being um, really kind of judgmental about white culture and those kinds of things. And I am to some degree. Um, but, you know, I mean, part of it is just, it's these uncon unconscious assumptions and our inability to get by them kind of look beyond them. And it's not just on an individual level. It's also on, you know, kind of on a group level, this understanding of what is seen as, well, of course, this is how we're going to do it. This, of course, this is, you know, these are the things that we have there. It's, you know, you talk about barriers to access, having to have an, a permanent address in order to have a library card. You know, having to have a parent come in and sign for a library card. Having to have a piece of ID, you know, um, if, you know, if you're a kid in a school and all you have is your school ID and you have parents who work all the time, can they really take the time to come and, you know, get you, a, you know, make sure that you can get a card? The idea that you have to actually pay to get a hold of IDs. Sometimes that's money that's, be that's better spent somewhere else. And of course there's that great, you know, to get the IDs, you have to live a 9 to 5 schedule. You know, you have to be able to get in while, the, while these places are open, which is also not always the easiest thing in the world to do. And these are just obvious ones that I can think of off the top of my head. These aren't necessarily things that are always, you know, there's a lot of other things that kind of feed into this. Budget cuts happen. What are the first libraries that get cut? School libraries. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those are the only libraries that kids have access to. Public library, you know, they get cut. The lowest use branches are the ones that <laughs> tend to get cut are the ones that perhaps don't have the highest circulation. Does that mean that they aren't more valuable than some of the others? Probably not. It depends on how they're used. When they were going to cut the libraries, the four branches here in Boston, one of them was um, the one in Dorchester, Washington, Washington Heights, something like that. It's one that actually the community fought to get put in. It's two rooms and, you know, public housing. You know, and it's one of the ones they wanted to kill. Well, if it's two rooms in public housing, what are the odds that the people who use that are going to be able to go elsewhere? But again, first ones to get cut, you're never going to see the libraries, you're never going to see Copley get cut down. I mean, they will cut their hours, but not you know to that same degree. But you're not necessarily going to see the stuff in Beacon Hill have to deal with the same issues that Again, for the library in, Dor in Dorchester has to. You know, again, these are the kind of things. And 
again, cuts are a different, are kind of a, an interesting issue, but it's something that you know you kind of have to think about in all of it. But I mean, this is this is one of the things that I think is important when you're talking about and why I think I'm part of this group. Why I'm part of the PLG. The other thing too that um, when you guys get a chance, read some of the stuff on on diversity in the literature. One of the biggest things, and one of the things that we kind of have to address that we don't, is when we talk about diversity, we talk about difference and the importance of difference. And don't get me wrong, I actually think diversity is incredibly important. What we don't talk about is what we're talking, what the difference is from. When we talk about introducing difference, we don't talk about, you know, what sets the normal. We just talk about what is different. We don't talk about, you know, how we're setting the language that we use when we talk about diversity. Is the language of others. You know, there's a lot of they. There's a lot of other groups. Where there's a lot of talking about, but we don't address what is that normal, what sets that normal. And there's a great quote, and I actually wrote this down on purpose, <laughs> from a woman, Lorna Peterson. If you ever want to read great stuff on diversity, Lorna Peterson writes some amazing articles. Um, but what she says here, if the language makes no distinctions among differences, the legacy of segregation, discrimination, and oppression can be denied. You know, if we just talk about diversity broad, if we just talk about differences. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is one of the things that's important when we don't make a distinction between what we're calling diverse and what we're calling normal. We're actually, um, Increasing the the power, I should say, of that hegemony, of that cultural force of what's actually defining what is normal. You know, because I don't know about you guys, but growing up, it never occurred to me that people wouldn't go to college. You know, I mean, it never occurred to me that people didn't want to learn. It never occurred to me. You know, I mean, of course you, of course you took the the college courses. Of course you you try to get to the AP classes. Why in the world wouldn't you? You know, and I saw nothing wrong with this. I, I still don't think there's anything wrong with that view, but I have a doctorate. Chances are, I think, education is important. <laughs> um, but I never thought about where that comes from. It never occurred to me to sacrifice going to school for my family. You know, never once in my mind did I think I should stay home and, you know, help take care of well, They didn't need me to, but it never even occurred to me that that might be a possibility. You know. I'm very lucky to be married to somebody who has let me move from all over the place as I pursued my degrees. You know, but it also never occurred to me that that wouldn't be an option. You know, and again, these are things that kind of feed into it, but it's one of the things you kind of have to recognize is that these prevailing forces in our culture, what are they driven by? Again, going back, who defines success? Who defines acceptable? Who defines what is seen as normalized? You know, and these are the things that really feed into what racism is today, or how it is that racism has a tendency to show itself, or not even show itself, but to be a part of how we institutionalize things, how we set policies, you know, to kind of how we do these things, because it's this cultural norm that we don't talk about. And it's, you know, this idea of things being set by a certain class, and I'm, you know, I mean, by a certain prevailing idea of what should be, and it's, it sets up, to some degree, a hierarchy in our society. A very unconscious one, but a hierarchy all the same that privileges some groups over others. You know, and it's, again, it's a hard one to talk about because if you ask people who are white, they'll say, I haven't had privileges. I've had to work for everything just like everybody else has. But the reality is, yes, we've had to work for things, but we haven't dealt with the same you know, because we're part of that assumption. We haven't had to deal with the same levels of barriers. We haven't necessarily had the same issues. And I say we in a very broad brush way. Of course, there's always going to be exceptions to everything that's being, that I'm talking about here. But it's something that's important to recognize that I don't think that we can actually address things like racism and diversity until we understand how we're defining it and what it is that goes into it and understanding the prevailing forces that are a big part of it. 